Well, good morning, and welcome to the Rivers Online Worship Experience. My name is Dean Ward, and I serve as the lead pastor of the River Church. And I am so grateful that you have chosen to join in with us here this morning. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a minute and sharing this with your friends, relatives, and neighbors, just copy the link or share it on Facebook. Or if you would like to subscribe, however you're viewing this, would love to give you an opportunity, if this is a blessing to you, to pass that blessing on to anybody else that you think might uh, be blessed by our time together. So you uh, may notice that I am wearing a Steeler jersey, and this Sunday the Steelers are not playing today, and so you're like, wait, what is going on? Well, they played Thursday night, and no plan of my own. Last minute, I was invited to attend the Steeler game, and it was a riveting game. The outcome was in doubt again until the fourth quarter, and then Kenny Pickett pulled pulled it out at the end. We won. Our defense came through. This sounds like a broken record. Isn't this what happens every time the Steelers win? It's not easy. It's nail-biting. It's filled with anxiety. But the Steelers won. Uh, I went to bed about 2.30 in the morning, and then <laughs> I've been going all day, and I just have forgotten to take off my Steeler clothes from the game. I've been so excited. No, not really, but uh, just wanted to to celebrate again. So thank you for joining in with us. Also, I want to celebrate the two uh, people that help bring this video to reality every week because I, they asked me where I want to film and I told them, I said, I want to be center of the balcony and I want to film straight on and that would have looked like this. I'd be standing under this projector, hitting my head on it and it would, it would have gone very badly. So. I am so grateful for the way they look out for me and look out for your viewing experience to make this a helpful time with less and less distractions. And you're like, Dean, your intros are always distractions. Well, <laughs> what is the matter with you? Let's get on to the sermon. Okay, so here we go. Today, uh, I want to take us back to 1985, if you will. Uh, perhaps you remember some of the music from 1985 because we really don't like to remember the fashions of 1985. Uh, Chess King and a lot of black and gray and big hair and just crazy stuff. But we, sometimes the music from 1985 uh, takes us to a great place. And there was a band uh, called Tears for Fears and they had a song that you know really was played all the time. And that song was just simply called Everybody wants to rule the world. And uh, this song, it's a catchy tune, but its lyrics are about the thirst for power and its consequences. And many thought it was about uh, the looming possibility of nuclear war. The original lyrics were, everybody wants to go to war. Now, that may seem more true today than ever before. Today's message, it's a message about power. It's a message about who rules and control. It's a message about transformation. And it's a message that's about your story and mine. So let's jump in. Uh, today's sermon is just simply called The Power of One. And we talk about uh, this movie uh, that was called The Power of One from 30 some years ago. It was Daniel Craig's first movie role. Uh, it, Morgan Freeman was in this movie, a younger Morgan Freeman, and a young boy in South Africa was um, showed the power of one person to transform a culture, a whole region, and yes, even an entire country. So today's message is just simply called 
the power of one. And we are in part six of our series of messages just simply called The Way. Now, you may be like, wait, last week Pastor Brian preached part number seven, and the last one you preached was part number six. Yes, because we didn't film a week. I didn't want you to miss part number six. So if you were with us in person on October 22nd, you would have caught this message. Uh, So if you have not been with us in person, you get to enjoy it today. So we're going to look today at Mark chapter 5 and this fascinating story that takes place. Uh, Let's begin in verse 1. It says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, so Jesus and his disciples were in a boat and they went across the lake to this other region in the Decapolis, which was not a Jewish region, uh, but it was more of a Gentile and even uh, strong pagan uh, components to the culture there. It says, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now, um, I I don't know about you when you might have read this story earlier in your days, what you might have envisioned, but I personally envisioned him navigating the crypts that are like down in the New Orleans or Louisiana, uh, the uh, above ground crypts that kind of are like a maze. I I imagine him kind of Uh, hanging out and that kind of thing. So I wanted to give you a couple of visual uh, reminders and images of what the tombs would have looked like. These are some in the cliff tombs, in the hillside tombs in this region today and what it would have looked like where he was hanging out. I also want you to see the hillside uh, going down to the lake so you can have a better uh, image of what we're looking at just a little bit later. Now, when you hear this story about this man in such a desperate place, perhaps you've wondered, how did he get there? I mean, this man was born and was a child to someone, was a son. How is it that he ended up in such a desperate place? The reality is, many times, people end up in unrecognizable, desperate places. The life that they had imagined as a young person or the life that their parents had imagined for them is nowhere to be found. And and you may wonder, how did they get there? Well, if you have found yourself in that place or maybe know someone that you love in that kind of desperate place. I I just want to encourage you today with this little reminder. Jesus makes all the difference. Regardless of how desperate of a place that you or one you love is in. I I was talking to a friend today about someone who uh, has a reputation for being in a desperate place and I asked him if he was going to invite him to one of our gatherings. And he said, well, you're, you're not going to save him. And I said, that's exactly right. I can't save anybody. But I know the one who can. And it's, <laughs> his name is Jesus. And Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, transforms lives. Uh, the second thing that I just want to note is I want to give us a moment to talk about evil and the demonic. Because it's clear (laughs) in our world today that evil is out there, is it not? 
I mean, it's hard to even watch the evening news and not become overwhelmed with the evil that uh, is plaguing our world today. But evil, it's more than just some nebulous out there force that we're, you know, not able to get real crystal clear about. We're like, yeah, I know something's off and something's out there and something's wrong, but I, I'm not sure what it is. Well, I, I want to just point out a few very clear things regarding evil. Uh, first of all, evil is personal. It's real and it's personal. I, I love the way that Jesus alerts us to the intent of the thief or the evil one in John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, the thief comes, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So if you ever wonder, wonder what the evil one's up to, is he just some little fictional character on my shoulder that whispers do bad things with a pitchfork and horns and a little red thing? Is that, is that what the essence of evil is? No. The evil one spends all day long, every day, scheming, planning, plotting, not to just make your life unhappy, not just to make your life a little uncomfortable. The evil one is gunning for you and for me. And it is his deepest desire to steal, to kill, and destroy. And so this evil, it's not just some nebulous out there notion. It is personal. Secondly, uh, evil is powerful. And it is in this world. And it is on display in so many ways. And it wrecks lives. It wrecks people. It destroys. It kills. Evil is powerful. And finally, uh, evil, it's pervasive. It is here today. We read this story that took place a couple thousand years ago nearly, and we think, oh, well, that was back then. But the reality is evil is pervasive and here today. I love the way that Paul alerts a young minister, Timothy, to this reality. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he says, The Spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith, and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. <laughs> Mark wants us to see that evil is real, personal, powerful, and per pervasive. But above all that, he wants us to see that Jesus has power over it all. Let's continue the story. In verse 6 of Mark 5, it says, When Jesus saw him from a distance, this man possessed by all these spirits, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Now, it's fascinating that the demons call him Son of God. Now this designation, this being called the Son of God, we don't see that in the book of Mark by a human being until the crucifixion. So even the demons know who Christ is before even the people that Jesus is discipling and walking with come to terms with it. And the demons, they... <laughs> They are not fuzzy about who Jesus is. Verse 7, he says, In God's name, don't torture me, the demons say, for Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. 
Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the region. Now, I love this image of this demon begging Jesus, pleading with Jesus, trying to bargain with Jesus, because this demon knows that Jesus has all the power. And Mark wants us to see who has the real power. Because at the end of Mark chapter 4, right before this takes place, Mark shows that, the, that Jesus has power over nature when he even speaks to the wind and the storm and calms the sea and has power over nature. Then we see here Jesus' power over spiritual forces. And the next two stories in Mark chapter 5 show how Jesus has power over sickness and brokenness when he heals the woman who had been suffering with this issue of bleeding for years and years. And Jesus has power over sickness and brokenness. And then finally, at the end of the passage, chapter 5, we see that Jesus even has power over death when he brings back to life Jairus' daughter who has passed away. So Mark wants us to know that Jesus has the power. Back to our story in verse 11. It says, A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demon begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Now this is a fascinating thing that takes place. And as we've talked about this power of evil, sometimes it's easy to live in fear of evil. And Mark isn't writing these words to leave us in fear, but to show us that we can live with lack of fear. We can live with confidence. We can live with power in Jesus Christ, and we can literally fear no evil. I want to invite you to take a minute and just enjoy this video called Fear No Evil. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I will not fear. But I am afraid. The shadow cast upon me in this valley is daunting. The anxiety is haunting. This lingering feeling of doom is weighing upon me. They say that when you've hit rock bottom, the only way is up. But honestly, the weight on my shoulders feels like too much. The fear of my situation is too real. The shadow cast over me is too dark. But the shadow of death is nothing more than just that. A shadow. A mirage of darkness attempting to block the light. Yet somehow, in just releasing my worries to the One, there is a peace beyond all understanding that covers me. A relief, as if expressing my grief has allowed my cares to be cast upon the One who holds the world in His hands. He is the One who has plans for my life. The one who sustains me when all seems lost. Who comforts me as his rod and staff guide my way. In this hour of darkness, I must stand up and take another step. Realizing that the shadow has no power over me. It cannot stop me from reaching your light. With each step towards my deliverer, the shadow seems weaker. Each moment I recognize I'm not alone, my fear becomes meeker. I am loved and protected. I am chosen and wanted. 
My life has a purpose. My Savior is near. I am a child of God, and I will not fear. It's my hope that that video just gives you a little confidence, gives you a little courage in living your life fearing no evil. Back to the story. We just read about the evil spirits being cast out and being permitted to go into the pigs. And if you heard the numbers correctly, 2,000 pigs ran down the hill into the lake. <laughs> like, can you imagine that? Like, what is happening? I mean, that is like, oh man. Well, let's pick the story up in verse 14. It says, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there. Now, he was dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. I, I, I just want to point out that the reality is there is no soul that is too far gone for Jesus to heal. Not one. If you feel like it's too late for you, you are too far gone, even God can't redeem you, even Jesus can't help you, I want to be crystal clear. There is not a soul that is too far gone for Jesus to redeem and heal and restore. I love this reality that this man was dressed and in his right mind, and it terrified them. (laughs) They didn't know what to do with all that. Now, I want to read to you the last part of John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus pointed out the evil one's nefarious actions and attempts to destroy our lives. But then Jesus comes through with this. He says, I have come. I have come. The Son of God has come. Jesus declares, I have come, that they may have life and have it to the full. Now, when you wonder what Jesus' agenda for you is, what Jesus' priority is for you, what Jesus' desire is for you, his deepest desire is to bring life to you in all of its fullness, giving you life to the full, to the fullest extent of what life can be. So if you feel like Jesus is just this cosmic killjoy, that doesn't want you to have any fun, that doesn't want you to have any fulfillment in life, that is a lie from the evil one trying to destroy you because Jesus has come to give you life, to give me life. And not just a little bit, but life in the fullest extent. Life to the full. Life in all of its fullness. There is victory, there is healing, there is restoration, there is life at the feet of Jesus. So, how do you think, um, (laughs) how do you think all this landed on the people? Well, let's look at verse 16. It says, those who had seen it told the people that what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. 
these people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. Jesus, please leave. Please get out of here. Like They weren't even concerned about the well-being of this one that Jesus healed. All they could grapple with and come to terms with was the loss, the economic loss of the 2,000 pigs. Now, that's a lot. I would come up with some silly pun here, but I'm going to avoid doing that. that. That's a lot of bacon that was lost. Sorry, I just did. Please forgive me. There was a lot lost there to that community. Uh, they lost part of their idol worship, most likely, and sacrificing pigs. And, and so uh, spiritually they lost. Economically they lost. Commercially they lost. But Jesus made the difference to this one man. Now I want to just point out uh, something that maybe you remember. Uh, it happened on March 28th of 1990. Yes, nearly 34 years ago. Michael Jordan scored an amazing 69 points against the Cleveland Cavaliers. At the end of the game, a reporter asked one of his teammates, uh, Stacy King, how he would remember this game and this epic performance. Now, Stacy King, he watched most of the game on the bench because he was a role player, but he was a role player <laughs> with a great sense of humor. Uh, which is what makes his response so classic because Stacy scored one point in that game. So when asked how he would remember this epic performance, Stacy King said, I will always remember this as the night that Michael Jordan and I combined for 70 points. Now, for the record, Stacy King rode Michael Jordan's coattails all the way to the NBA championship. And because he played on the team with Michael Jordan, he won not just one, not just two, but three NBA championships and has the rings to prove it, thanks to Michael Jordan. Now, I, I want to thank Mark Batterson for that story and telling it that way because uh, I was young, not that young, but I don't remember this interchange. Uh, but I wanted to share it with you because it reminds me of this great passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 8, verse 37. And this three-word phrase, more than conquers, it says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And Paul is saying that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And that three-word phrase, more than conquerors, it's a, it's a um, Greek word, <laughs> uh, hypernikeo. And this is a unique compound Greek word that literally means to hyper-conquer, to over-conquer, to conquer with success, to spare. It is a defining victory that demoralizes your opponent. Now, I know when it comes to looking at your life and the forces that you face in your life, that it can feel overwhelming. But through Jesus Christ, you and I are more than conquerors. When in our relationship with Him, in our journey with Him as followers of Christ, when we bring just our one, one small effort in following Him, He allows us to be more than conquerors in and through Him. He allows us to hyper-conquer, to over-conquer, to conquer with success, to 
spare. Well, let's look at how this story ends. Beginning in verse 18, it says, as Jesus was getting in the boat, so he, he followed the community's desire for him to get out of Dodge, so he's leaving. The man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Can you imagine having Jesus change your life so radically and you just want to follow him. Other followers are following him. You want to be one that follows him and goes with him and soaks up more that he has to offer. But listen to how Jesus responded. It says, Jesus did not let him. <laughs> Jesus gave him a hard no, you can't come with me. But Jesus said, go home to your own people and tell them, how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. <laughs> A request denied. Now I know when I come to Jesus and I get a hard no from him, I want to like, but Lord, you don't understand, but Jesus, I, I, I think I have the, the better perspective. Why can't you do it my way? But Jesus, he knew the best way because so often his hard no in my life and hard no in your life is designed to open up a whole new possibility that you never even imagined. In Mark chapter 7, just a couple chapters after this, Jesus goes back to the Decapolis and a small group of people are there to hear him teach. And then in Mark chapter 8, Jesus goes back to the same area where this man had told his story. And he told the story enough that the next time he went back, uh, more people came to hear him. And then in Mark 8, he goes back and over 4,000 people are there to hear this story of what Jesus is doing and the difference he's making. Now, one person, one single person, just one small voice, the power of one. Uh, Imagine with me if it really was his story, his transformed life that was reaching not just a handful, but thousands of people with the message of the transforming work of Christ. The power of one. Hmm. What if God's plan is to show you the power of one. To show you what he wants to do, to show the world what he wants to do through you, through your story, through your journey. The power of a changed life. I want to end this morning with a story that many of you possibly are aware of. It's a story about a girl named Kat Von D. Now, if you don't know who Kat Von D is, here's, a, here's an image of her. Um, she is an incredible tattoo artist who previously had a national TV show called LA Inc. She was once obsessed with the occult and witchcraft. And yet, she left behind her old way of life in California, moved to a small town in Indiana, and after finding faith in Jesus Christ, she came out as a new Christian a, a year ago. In 2022, this was big news in that culture. A couple of weeks ago, she was baptized in a small Baptist church as a sign of her new faith. Here's a, video, or here's a, a scene of that, a picture of that. Now the video of this, you can, you can watch it, 
it went viral. It went all over. The person recording this uh, account said, I read an article today where she tragically stated that even though a majority of her followers are non-believers, that the worst criticism and vitriol she has gotten for receiving Christ is from other people claiming to be Christians. So what? She wears black. So what? She's covered with tattoos. She is a new follower of Christ. And she is now your sister, if you are a follower of Christ. Now, she may not fit the stereotypical look, but she should be embraced, loved, and welcomed with open arms. This person continues and says, the sad truth is, that the biggest deterrent to people knowing Christ is the very people that say they follow him. Seems many of us have forgotten our own sinful past and also failed to remember that Jesus always ran to the broken, to the marginalized, the outcast, (laughs) and unaccepted. We must do better. Her life has been transformed. This man in this story, his life was transformed. And if you are a follower of Christ, no matter how far you thought you were lost and a helpless case, your life has been transformed. So I want to invite you, tell your story. Lean in to the power of God working through you just through telling your story. And may God display the power of one transformed life to your friends, to your relatives, to your neighbors, to those that are looking on, wondering if Jesus might have the power to help them. God bless you, everybody. Thank you for joining in with us today. And if you want to accept Jesus Christ into your life and experience that power, I want to invite you to do that. Call on his name. Confess your sin to him. Accept him as your leader and your savior and your friend. Embrace the free gift of salvation through him. And you can do that just by praying and calling on to him now. May God bless you. Thank you for joining in with us today. Cannot wait till I get to see you again next week. God bless.